Welcome to the Cloud Pod, where the forecast is always cloudy. We talk weekly about all things AWS, GCP, and Azure. We are your hosts, Justin, Jonathan, Ryan, and Peter. You can't protect what you don't know you have. Not only your cloud services and workloads, but more importantly, what your data is and where it's stored. Without visibility into your data inventory, you have a blind spot that can quickly result in costly data breaches and privacy violations. Data stores in the cloud can be spun up and down on demand, making them difficult to track and manage. Nobody wants to be surprised by hidden risks. So listen later in the show to learn how Open Raven can help you discover, visualize, and track your cloud data assets in real time. Episode 101, recorded on January 18th, 2020. AWS plays the parlor games. Good evening, Jonathan, Ryan, and Peter. How's it going? Good. Yeah. So hello, far. Hello. We're early in the year yet. <laughs> <laughs> it is, no more, no more it is weird this week. <laughs> that it's already Martin Luther King Day in January. I'm like, oh, well, we skipped last week and we're kind of combining this week and last week for this recording. So, but you know, the news has just been really slow out of all the cloud providers, which is, you know, after the crazy year, I think they're all taking a little, little sabbatical here in January, which is just fine. Yeah. I'm I would like this whole day actually because it creeps up on me and I always forget that it's there until it's, oh, we got a long weekend. I'm like, oh, great. It's like a, it's like an extra bonus holiday. <laughs> Unless you don't have it, like I didn't have it today. So. <laughs> oh, oh, sorry. That's all right. But it's a very quiet day in general when no one else is working because your company is yeah. working. So you realize everyone else is actually off for the day and you still set up to work. <laughs> it's kind of nice though. You, get cre- you, you don't waste a PTO day and you get to get real work done because no one's bugging you. That's true. That's why I work through Christmas break typically because it's the best time of the year. Like you get so much done in those two weeks. If you have been paying attention to... United States government and the coup and the all these things, you know that apparently Parler was involved very heavily with people arranging and coordinating their attack on the Capitol building in the Parler service, as well as many other services where right wing people apparently hang out. But one thing I didn't know was that apparently Parler is hosted on top of AWS or was. Until. <laughs> <laughs> Whoopsie. So apparently they were leveraging EC2 instances, etc. Amazon basically has been trying to get them to address what they're seeing as systematic errors in their content policing and content moderation capabilities and had reported over 100 pieces of content between things like after the firing squads are done with the politicians, the teachers are next, death of Zuckerberg, real Jeff Bezos, Jack Dorsey, and Pichai, and content encouraging violence grew rapidly, apparently after the riots on Wednesday, and Amazon basically has said, you guys have no plan to monitor your service, and you're violating our terms of service because you don't have content moderation at scale, and they claim there was over 26,000 moderation requests at the time when they shut down the service, killing them last Sunday. Parler said uh, they'll be back up within 24 hours. It's now a week later, and they're still not up. Although they did get a landing page up last night to tell you that they're going to come back eventually. But, you know, they were cut off not only from uh, Amazon, but also Apple and the Google Play Store, as well as I'm sure there's not very many vendors who are willing to work with them at this point in time. So rough day. But uh, the big reason I want to talk about this was really more about the really bad Twitter takes I've been seeing about, you know, Amazon's going to kill my service and this is why we should be multi-cloud or this is why we shouldn't go to the cloud at all because of Parler. And I really struggle with the fact that if you're, you know, your platform is being used to take over the U.S. government or overthrow government in general, I'm not sure that you should be on Amazon or any cloud provider for that matter or anywhere in the world, really. So that was my, my quick cough. take on it. But, you know, I'm sure <laughs> some people will argue this comment and I can't wait for those arguments because, you know, it's kind of a bit of a tell. Co-location providers are going to pull the power to your cage. The virtual hosting companies are going to turn off your account. The Comcast is going to turn off your business account if you've got a server at your house and that's your internet connection. Being multi-cloud is not going to help. It's not. But isn't it interesting that just a couple of years ago, we were all celebrating the use of technology in uh, the Arab Spring, which is basically the same thing, but in a different part of the world. Yeah. Yeah. That, that was that oil. <laughs> <laughs> so we we, we like it when it's working it. for us, not against us. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's right. Yeah, no, us. no hypocrisy. No, no, mm-hmm. no. My first thought exactly was the same thing. Like, oh, the multi-cloud people are going to be unlivable now. Like, because it's, but I think it's an argument against because I've been on like a no politics news like blackout since like April. But this one sneaks in there because of its ties in. And I, but it, it truly is fascinating to me how this company like runs their 
business from a technology perspective, you know, where the liability is. I love, you know, both sides of that, thinking about how Amazon has to, you know, protect itself from, you know, basically reputation and, and liability. And then Parler goes and sues them for violating antitrust somehow, which doesn't make sense. But there's a specific clause in antitrust meeting that you have to basically do all diligence to make sure that you're, you know, protecting against this kind of malicious activity. So it turns out to be, you know, Parler's argument in the lawsuit is actually Amazon's biggest bullet towards it. So it's, it is a really fascinating story. I think it's for multi-cloud purposes, I think it's actually very telling because Parler, from all accounts, did everything they could to avoid vendor lock-in. They specifically didn't use a lot of AWS technologies and services so that they could move from cloud to cloud. And yet, when the rubber meets the road, they still can't re-host onto anyone else. There's, you know, I'm not sure anyone would have them, but some of the specs they, they were you know, running on top of Amazon, like there's not a lot of companies who can provide you that kind of hardware. They'll end up moving out of out of the country, presumably to a place where there's less care for acceptable use of services. They'll end up in Russia or something. What they should do is like re-architect their app to not run on like just all the resources in the world for all the money. My understanding of their stack was that's a very, very heavy Node.js application and yeah, the mobile app was not their best. <laughs> I will tell you, looking at it and coming from a mobile company in the past, it was not a very well written app, and it was done very quickly. But you know, it's interesting the Twitter argument that you know, so their basically their antitrust argument is that Amazon is conspiring with Twitter to kill them because you know after this, Twitter has had a tremendous amount of growth. People have jumped onto Twitter because Parler's gone offline and vice versa, and they were going to have a huge amount of uh, growth after. The capital riots as you know, people were being ban hammered from all the social media networks. And so they've lost growth and all that traffic went to Twitter instead, which I don't know if that's true, but it's a really sad argument <laughs> for it, why. It is. And it's, yeah. it's also missing the point, which is that Twitter does have massive amounts of content moderation. They do. Yeah. And they have done. And Facebook do the same thing. So, you know, and like, of course, you know, there's right wing media people who are saying, oh, see these posts that Twitter didn't remove. It's like, well, were they reported? If they weren't reported, then Twitter doesn't always know. The part that I always find funny is the right side has always been saying or the, the alt-right side has been saying you know section 230 has to go <laughs> and you know these companies need to be held reliable and responsible for this content and then when they do exactly <laughs> something to protect themselves in the event that 230 actually gets repealed they're now being said it's you know it, it's killing free speech uh, which is really interesting so just yeah i don't i don't fully understand sure they understand what the ramifications or what this stuff means that kills me every time, though. The number of times I hear people complaining about free speech when it comes to capital enterprises providing services, I think unless you understand that the only protection is from the government oppressing your free speech and not from corporations, I mean, you're onto a non-starter right there. That's always my favorite argument when we – these content moderation. So it's like or we really trust Facebook to do all this moderation. We really trust Twitter. We really trust these companies. We're like, yeah, because otherwise the government is doing all that moderation. And guess what? Then it is a free speech violation. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny. I was, I was reading an article over the weekend and they were talking about how, you know, basically, you know, the hippies have kind of started this whole thing because back in the, you know, the 60s, Basically, restaurants and stuff wanted to keep the hippies out of the restaurants. So they came up with no shoes, no service to basically keep the hippies out, which is basically the same thing as companies now saying you can't if you're not wearing masks, you can't come into the store. Same stuff. And like we've had no shirt, no shoes for I you know, since I was a child. I remember it as a kid. This is not a new thing. It's just people don't understand the law, which yeah. is really and even farther back, no pants. Like you've had to wear pants well before the hippies. Yeah, I, that's <laughs> true. God damn it. In your house, you don't have to wear pants, Ryan. It's oh, thank God. I wonder okay. why I can never get served. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I'm not talking about you know, papers to appear in court. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, you know, again, I, the other part of this parlor story was you know, they were saying they could be back up and running in 24 hours. And the only way I could see that happening is if they were already in the process of moving to a private infrastructure and already purchased all this hardware. So I'm not surprised they're still down, to be honest. I, I think no, they're, not at all. I don't know sure they're, they're ever going to come back. Yeah, uh, they're down. And I think it's that this is exactly it. You can work, you can build your entire stack on being, you know, cloud agnostic and do all these things, but the reality is not there. You know, these people that think that you should be able to move your workload from cloud to cloud to cloud, like it doesn't work that way. And it's three times the cost, three times the complexity. Just, you know, if I was running a company and I would just try to not violate my terms of service and get booted off. 
the thing about those terms of service is you can pick a different cloud, you can pick a different provider, but ultimately those acceptable use policies roll up to the people who provide the same services to all the clouds, and that's the ATs and Ts, Verizon, Sprints, who provide the tier one internet services, and their AUPs to the cloud providers say exactly the same thing, that you will not use our networks to ship things which are illegal, harmful, inciting, whatever. And so if Amazon or Azure or Google didn't also enforce those AUPs, all their customers will get cut off. <laughs> it just moves their liability. <laughs> there's, yeah. there's nowhere to go. Like, build new internet, I guess. No, please don't. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's, let's get off politics because I hate yeah. talking about politics on the show. But yeah, this is one that <laughs> hit us right. Kind of like, oh, we can't really ignore that one too much. Yeah. It's, it's going to, in you know, lots of conversations over the next year, unfortunately, around multi-cloud. And they'll use this example, unfortunately. You know, I will say one, one last thing, though, is that most of those arguments that came from people on Twitter and other social media about Amazon pulling the plug came way before any information was available about the fact that Amazon had been sending them parlor notices for months. I hadn't even heard that. Interesting. It was also framed as though, well, it's only been three days. Why, why didn't you give them more notice? And Amazon's like, well, we did. They ignored us. <laughs> In the countersuit to the lawsuit about antitrust, they actually detail out. They've been reported over a hundred different things to Parler to be resolved. Those get resolved, but nothing. Yeah, you know, but then the next day there's something exactly like it gets reposted by the same people. They are also talked about you know working with through their account team, all the stuff, trying to get them to do the right thing here, and they just didn't. You know, the same thing happens with your SES subscription, right? Like you have to manage bounces and spamming, and if your you know your SES account is being you know blacklisted, you're going to get in trouble with Amazon. Like it's it's not new. <laughs> this has always been not a thing new. about AWS. All right. Again, moving on. F5 Networks has apparently decided they want to continue to buy infrastructure in the cloud technology world with the purchase of Volterra for five hundred million. Volterra apparently does edge as a service capability company, which I don't know what that means, but it's buzzword bingo here, so that's what it is. Volterra was founded in twenty seventeen and came out of stealth in twenty nineteen, and the platform apparently helps DevOps and NetOps teams ease their operational security and performance challenges as their apps and data are distributed across cloud or edge environments. Here's a quote from Francis Loco Denou. For current edge solutions are simply inadequate for today's enterprise customers. It's time to break out of closed edge systems that only perpetuate the pain of building, running, and securing apps. With Volterra, we advance our adaptive applications vision with an edge 2.0 platform that solves the complex multi-cloud reality enterprise customers confront. Our platform will create a SaaS solution that solves our customers' biggest pain points. Will create a platform. So, so is, it, is it vaporware? <laughs> I'm glad you, like, edge as a service, like, ticked you. You're like, what is that as well? Because uh, when researching this, I, I had the exact same thing. Like, what does this do exactly? I don't know if it was the first story or not set me in ranty mode already, but like the more I dove into what Voltaire does as a service, the more sort of frustrated I got with no one's really solving this problem. They're only selling the solution to this problem and it's not a full-fledged solution. So I, the promise is that with a true service mesh, you'll be able to define your network requirements for your application at application time using some service that will automatically configure that for, you know, on the network to allow communication between here and there. But none of these companies are really truly solving that. They're either half implementing service mesh and providing a GUI on top of it, or they're just saying, hey, we've built a, you know, Kubernetes plugin so that it'll, it'll register with, you know, the open source, basically service mesh that's underlying all these things. I got more and more frustrating that, you know, that this, because I see this story time and time again, different network stories, different network applications are doing the exact same thing, but they're still not really solving it. There's no real seamless way to do service mesh in today. There's no something, you know, you can build something very pigeonholed around Kubernetes, or you can have something that's basically very hard to cobble together to make it do what you want. But Everyone's sort of lumping behind these promises of fixing it versus actually doing it. I, I don't like how much buzzword bingo is in this one. I don't like, like how much rough edges and sort of hand waving that these product papers have for Volterra. You know who does like the buzzword bingo? F5. The people VCs. who got the 500 million. Yeah, <laughs> that is very much true. <laughs> I, kind of, I kind of assumed it was like a multi cloud. Interf like the multi interface kind of things for, for edge computing, so you can deploy your apps any on any place, and it provides the front door to your app wherever it's hosted. It's really hard to tell exactly what this service does by reading through. So I, you know, maybe, but from what I glean, <laughs> I mean, for a startup, it's only been in production since 2019, right? They have Volt Mesh, Volt Stack, Volt Global Network, Volt Console, and Volt Share. 
<laughs> like you already have five products and you've already sold for five hundred million dollars. Oh, these are all buzzword bingo products, I'm sure. Yeah, you know, but again, like the fact that he's using the terminology edge makes me think something different than you know service mesh, multi cloud service mesh, which is a different thing. And you know, again, I feel like it's a weird product. I don't know what they're going to do with it yet. I don't know what they're doing with Nginx still. <laughs> so. You know, maybe they can come up with a strategy that actually works with Nginx and F5 and balances out the multi-cloud hybrid story, but I I don't see it in this announcement so far. Yeah, the Nginx version just makes sense to me when you consider about, you know, how F5 does a whole bunch of weird application routing using iRules in their, in their product. And then, you know, how a lot of open source apps and smaller companies that aren't using F5 use Nginx as part of their app stack. That one at least makes sense to me. This well, one is sort why of... Why does it make sense, though? So what's your upsell to F5 hardware or oh, just... F5 software? There's no upsell there. It's basically... Nginx is, I think, a bet for them to be future-proofing. So if they can't get F5 to properly scale on, you know, just normal Linux, they can pivot to Nginx. They can rebrand Nginx to be F5 Cloud or F5, you know, not in a box, and basically sell that in some other way. And they'll put... They'll shove F5 stuff on top of it over time, is my feeling, but... You know, they haven't really touched it in the last year and a half since they've owned it. So I'd, who knows what they're really doing with it? I think it's it's a portability play, right? Like if you're already using Nginx, you can you can easily just drop us a billion dollars and plug in those same rules into our, our load balancer. I thought the Nginx acquisition is more about the Kubernetes ingress controller and providing sort of getting into the container ecosystem like everyone else. That's part of it. But I mean, there's also... Ton of different reasons why they wanted it. Again, how do they integrate them? How do you get the? How do you get from F five to Nginx? You know, even in a Kubernetes controller, I, I don't know. If that makes sense yet, but we'll see. Well, the acquisitions kept on coming this week as well as a Red Hat has announced its intent to purchase Container and Kubernetes threat detection company Stackrox. Stackrox was founded in 2014 and sells cloud based platform that offers continuous advanced threat detection for cloud native apps, which means it scans at build time and at runtime. That's what it means when it says continuous. Apparently, Red Hat's going to be integrating this into the OpenShift platform to make container workloads more secure. So if you're using Stackrocks for your security needs on your container workload, you may be needing to move off this platform if they're going to kill it for everything but OpenShift, unless you plan to adopt OpenShift as well. There's a quote here from Paul Comier, the Red Hat Chief Executive Officer. Securing Kubernetes workloads and infrastructure cannot be done in a piecemeal manner. Security must be an integrated part of every development deployment, not an afterthought. Red Hat adds Stackrox's Kubernetes native capabilities to OpenShift's layered security approach, furthering our mission to bring product-ready open innovation to every organization across the open hybrid cloud across IT footprints. I wish it was a lightning round already. Because when they come <laughs> out with a statement in a press release, containers should be you know, at the forefront of everyone's uh, you know, secu- security was should be at the forefront of everyone's needs. Well, where were you five years ago? <laughs> I mean, the other great quote in here was from Kamal Shah, the C- current CEO of StackRox. While this seems obvious today, it wasn't so then. He wrote in a blog post, fast forward to 2020 and Kubernetes has emerged as the de facto operating system for cloud native applications and hybrid cloud environments, explaining why they focus exclusively on Kubernetes security. <laughs> Which I'm like, well, you just, you know, you saw Google did it and you were like, well, we'll get on top of that bandwagon. As far as Google <laughs> didn't actually buy them. So it's weird. You know, I wonder if Google really needs something like Stackrocks or, you know, I don't know Google's internal development, but, you know, like it's the Google already has the scanning and the ICD part of the vulnerability built into their registry product. And so the runtime, you know, I'm not sure that if it as makes as much sense, it's it's expensive. It's definitely something that can destroy production runtimes if not done well. It'd be interesting to see how, you know, if people do start rolling that out into their like cloud native, like if they're, I guess, the running the the core orchestration, like your Fargates, your what's the Google uh, container engine? Well, Anthos too, yeah. Adding these as part of that product. It does make sense. Isn't it weird though that everyone flocks to Kubernetes because they think it's the best play for compatibility across the clouds? Oh, I can run these Kubernetes stuff anywhere. But then all the supporting infrastructure around Kubernetes is all very, very cloud specific. But now we've got all very lock in. (laughs) It's interesting, Stackrox's product page says they have, you know, their, the features of Stackrox are visibility into your entire landscape of images, registries, containers, deployments, and runtime, risk profiling, vulnerability management, configuration management, compliance, threat detection, network segmentation, and incident response. And then in the OpenShift Red Hat announcement, the only thing they talk about is threat detection, <laughs> which means all the other stuff they don't want. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> they just want the threat detection for OpenShift. The rest of it is already covered by OpenShift, so sorry. Well, a lot of yeah, a lot of the visibility of you know what's running where is, is provided built into the OpenShift product, so it makes sense. 
as well as the configuration management and the vulnerability stuff. That's all on OpenShift natively. Segmentation and service meshes in OpenShift. So it makes sense to me that they're really looking for this IP. We might be doing an OpenShift project in a few months. So if we do, I will bring any feedback. It's a good product. I mean, I, th- I think if you want platform as a service with Kubernetes, I think it's great. I don't particularly want that, but I know people do. Hey, everyone. Jonathan here. I just wanted to take a minute to thank the cloud consulting gurus at Foghorn for helping make the cloud pod possible. These folks truly get it. Cloud consulting experts since 2008, they are premier tier partners with AWS, Google Cloud Platform Silver, and Microsoft Azure partners. From multi-cloud to containers to moving full production workloads to the cloud under the tightest compliance, Foghorn's team of full-stack cloud engineers have been there, done that, gotten the t-shirt, and are ready to share their experience with you. If you're in the market for some talent to supplement your team, visit www.fogops.io slash the cloud pod. www.fogops.io slash the cloud pod. Foghorn, the promise of cloud delivered. All right. Well, our final general news announcement, Pat Gelsinger, who is currently the VMware CEO, has decided to leave VMware and go back to Intel as their new CEO on February 15th meaning there will be a new CEO at VMware sometime in the next six months. Pat apparently has a very long history with Intel, working there for 30 years before joining VMware in 2009. Intel clearly recognized that they needed a veteran who understood Intel and has experience and knowledge of Intel to help compete in the increasingly aggressive chip industry landscapes, which makes him the perfect fit. I unfortunately think he has a very long road ahead to get Intel back on track, (laughs) but good to see him moving out. And then kind of answers, asks the question, like, what happens with VMware now? Does the new CEO come in, still keep down this Kubernetes? path? Does he continue to capitulate to the cloud providers? Does he pivot in a different direction? It's going to be really interesting to see what happens with VMware. Because I think Pat Gelsinger's strategy for going all in on Kubernetes is the right one. But you know, a new leader will come in and say, that's, not, that's my predecessor's plan, not my plan. Yeah, that's my biggest question. Like, you know, finally, some good things coming out of VMware recently in the last few years. So hopefully that continues. But before that, it was largely dwindling as you know, workloads moved into cloud where VMware may not be as big a part of that picture. I commend Pat on his energy level because if I spent 30 years at Intel, then 11 at VMware, I think <laughs> I would be done. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. For real. VP of counting my money. I just don't know that Intel is savable at this point. Like, I, you know, the rumors are AMD is going to go really big into server side chips, even bigger than they already have with Epic. Like the next generation of Epic, they're saying, is going to blow the Xeons out of the water. And then they're already losing on the video card space. They're already losing on desktop CPUs, on CPU speed. They can't get to 7 and 9 nanometers. Like Intel's got a lot of problems. I'm not sure that a guy who knows how they've always done it at Intel is going to be able to come up with the right innovation strategy to get you to the next level versus, you know, bringing in someone from AMD or some of these other companies that actually has been successful getting to the next chip size. I think they need to suck it up and just pay TSMC to make chips for them unless there's some kind of exclusive deal that they have with AMD. But it looks like they're just going to have to give up on what they're doing right now just to keep up with, you know, just so they don't fail miserably before they can succeed. It is interesting they haven't tried to come out with anything to be kind of the next generation of Intel, but interesting times. If companies like IBM and are still around, like, do you really think that Intel is just going to die away? Well, IBM sells a lot of services. But I mean, that's the part of IBM's change, too. They're going to sell off the services business to its own thing. So that's where things get kind of weird for me with Intel or IBM these days, because they're going all in on OpenShift and Red Hat as the future for IBM. They're going to take the services business, which is a ton of recurrent, you know, deferred revenue and ton of services revenue. They're going to dump that into its own company. It's going to be a weird transition. I think that's supposed to happen this year, isn't it? They haven't announced the name of the new services company yet. I imagine it'll have blue in the name. <laughs> <laughs> Blue Origin Consulting. (laughs) (laughs) All right. AWS has a bunch of stuff for us this week. First up is the AWS Transfer Family, which is their overly complicated name for FTP, FTPS, and SFTP. Now supports Amazon Elastic File System, or EFS, as well as S3, which is supported at launch. This allows you to easily and securely provide your business partners access to files stored in EFS volumes. These EFS volumes can be accessed from Docker containers, EC2 instances, or any other service that supports EFS volumes, enabling a large number of use cases and solutions. Providing access to EFS volume will be through a resource-based policy through IAM. The whole service is around basically backward compatibility and supporting legacy workloads. So, I mean, surprised they didn't support EFS first, actually. 
I think everyone doing F3, FS, or FS3 FS sync, whatever that was. Yes. I think they desperately wanted to kill that as fast as possible. So by making it S3 first, that was their play initially. Then everyone said, well, we really like to have that in EFS because then we could just upload files in a terrible pipeline method and update our servers that way. <laughs> I still don't think there's a good user management story, though, for, you know, if you want to provide FTP as a service to your customers for legacy reasons. If it's all based on IM policies, I mean, you're supposed to create IM users for each one of your own customers. It doesn't make sense. We're kind of missing kind of like the federated authentication piece. It's kind of terrible because it's it specifically doesn't use IM permissions for authenticating FTP or SFTP. It does use the traditional username password basic auth. You know, if you, you use the fancy method, you can use a certificate. But yeah, this is, I think this is just, you know, the IM permissions are just the resources once they're into the transfer family. Like if they're on S3 or they're on EFS, you have access to them. Well, they have that, that EFS access point that I assume is where they're enforcing some of that through the FTP endpoint. I suppose it's motivation to modernize though, having to manually maintain lists of users and passwords. <laughs> well, I mean, the funny thing is when I see this get used is the the people that specifically don't want to modernize. Like, I don't want to have to teach my customers a new way of getting me stuff. Or require them a new way, right? I'm happy mm-hmm. to teach them. Like, I have tons of customers. Happy to teach them. They won't listen. What are we going to do? We don't want to wait to move to AWS until after every single one of our customers agrees. And we don't want to ditch our customers. So... Well, I mean, it would be nice, though. I agree. I think if that's a service or transfer family basically would tie into either Cognito or, you know, simple directory service or one of the AD services they offer, that'd be nice. I don't know why. It that would be neat. Has a different directory store. It's a little weird. Well, Amazon EMR is now going to support Apache Ranger, which will provide you fine-grained data access controls to define, enforce, and audit fine-grained data access. With this new feature, you can define and enforce one database table and column level authorization policy for Spark and Hive users to access data through Hive Metastores, and two with prefix object level authorization policies with access to data in S3 or EMRFS. Apache Ranger is an open source tool to enable, monitor, and manage comprehensive data security across the Hadoop platform. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely important, right? You, you know, all these companies now aggregating all this data, some of it extremely sensitive. All of these tools help. I'm glad they're not reinventing the wheel like the Amazon EMR file system, which was a weird hack <laughs> just versus supporting native S3 in Hadoop. That They are actually using just the open source project, which is kind of nice. Capitalizing on somebody else's work. God, how many times I've heard that in the last week? It's just insane. Evil. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I, <know. laughs> I actually don't have that story in the... In the news this week, I forgot about it, but it's Elasticsearch changing their uh, licensing terms <laughs> this week. They basically made it so that all of their product now is underneath their new terrible licensing, which kills the cloud provider usage of their products. And so now all the cloud providers are basically orphaned on, I think it was uh, 611 or something like that, some old version. Although I think they've all kind of moved past that now at this point. What's the name of the service going to be with Elasticsearch compatibility? Which that should be a little game we play. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Nice. Ask me in the lightning round. I'll have something funny by then. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Achieve a faster database failover with the new Amazon Web Services MySQL JDBC driver. This is available for both RDS MySQL databases and Aurora MySQL databases and will reduce the failover time from minutes to seconds. The new driver is based on MySQL Connect slash J and is compatible with all MySQL deployments available in the cloud. If you ever used the native JDBC driver for MySQL and had to do failover DR testing, it is super annoying how slow it was before. Minutes Finally, just is re-resolve very the DNS. Re-resolve the DNS. Like, don't mm-hmm. wait five minutes. <laughs> Try it was always one. caching it. Always yep. caching so it. simple. Never simple. <laughs> All right. GCP has a exciting feature for Peter and I. They are introducing the ability to run Ruby on Google Cloud Functions. Yes. yes. Google Cloud Functions is bringing support for Ruby, a popular gentleman, popular, Very popular. general yeah, purpose programming language to cloud functions. With the functions framework for Ruby, you can write idiomatic Ruby functions to build business critical applications and integration layers. Cloud functions for Ruby supports 2.6 and 2.7. Ruby environments complete with access to resources and private VPC networks. HTTP functions can respond to HTTP events, cloud event functions sourced from various cloud and G cloud services, including PubSub, cloud storage, and the Firestore, all to be processed by that Ruby goodness. Love it. I'm trying to figure out if the reason why I hate Ruby so much is because I started as a Perl programmer. <laughs> like, it's it could be. Ruby, <laughs> you know, like, and I, you know, like Perl was definitely the devil I know. Like, I hated it. So now a lot of the Rubyisms, I'm just like, why would you do it this way? And the rest of the world is, why would you do it that way? <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, I mean, I mean, looked at Pearl very heavily. I'm like, I don't understand why you did it this way. Why make it this way? Hello, I'm Mark, co-founder and chief product officer at Open Raven. We built our platform to address the clear need for companies to better track and secure their data in the cloud. Open Raven continuously monitors and maps data hosted in your AWS cloud. We alert you about security events and archive events for analytics to capture trends over time. With our real-time data discovery that scales to any environment, you get a complete asset inventory and data catalog to power your security program and prevent data breaches. Visit openraven.com slash the cloud pod to learn more and start a free trial to discover, classify, monitor, and protect the data you have in the cloud. Well, if one of your New Year's resolutions was that you were going to learn Google Cloud, which is definitely a good track if you were looking to get into the cloud space these days, Google is offering you free training, which is always a win. I love this time of year because all the cloud providers typically roll something out. So Google has the ability to now take up to four different tracks from very aptly named Getting Started, a data analytics track, a hybrid and multi-cloud track, and a ML and AI track all available to you for free. This allows you to build up your Google Cloud Scale badges to showcase your cloud competencies. You can find this in the link in our show notes if you want to go sign up for this free training, which is available now here in January and February before it goes away until 2022. I will probably be taking up on this just because it is one of my sort of desires to, to learn a little bit more about both Google and Azure. So this is great. I like when they offer these things. I've taken part of them in the past. Yeah, I've done a few this way as well. That's how I got into Oracle. That's how I got into Azure originally. I did do Google's version of this last year, actually, or the year before, I don't remember. So I probably should do it again because it's changed a lot since I've used it last. I feel obligated to just do something regarding ML and AI just so I can speak intelligently on the topic. I noticed there was no IoT class because I really want an IoT class because I need to learn more about IoT for my own personal reasons. I should check out the M5 stack stuff from Amazon. They partnered with M5 stack to make some nice little new I- IoT devices, which are way better than those little buttons they had years ago. Where the only thing you could do that was nearly imaginative was, you know, it could be the network kill switch or something that you keep on the on somebody's desk or whatever. But now they've got some cool little gadgets now. Yeah, I bought one because of you. So I thank you for that $50 that I spent. Only 50 Oh, you didn't buy all the extras to go I with it. I didn't buy all the extras. I didn't know <laughs> I should buy all the extras. So. <laughs> like, what am I going to do with this? I don't know. I figured it out. Make a network kill switch, probably. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. There you go. (laughs) All right. Well, Azure is in the news as being one of the top three databases of 2020. This is not because Azure said they were. It's because dbengines.com said they were. Apparently, they are one of the most popular databases of 202, according to DB Engines, who recently announced their DBMS of the Year awards. DB Engine collects information on database management systems, and it provides a widely accepted popularity ranking of database management systems. Azure SQL Database popular score increased 253% from a year ago, placing in the top three database systems of the year, a first for a cloud database in the nine years DB Engine has been publishing their rankings. And so I was curious, they said very clearly top three, they didn't say which spot in the top three. So then I had to go to they the blog post. They didn't say top two. And, they didn't say top two. <laughs> yeah, they didn't say top two. So, I, you know, so apparently the first one is Postgres, SQL, and then Microsoft Azure, and then MongoDB. Aurora is in the list, as well as Cloud Spanner, and others are just not as high up on the list. It's a little weird, because when you look at some of the other details they have, they have like SQL Server broken out, and then they have Azure SQL Server broken out, and this other chart, and Azure SQL Server is way down the bottom versus SQL Server. Like, did you guys just combine those together? And then is that how you got there for 2020? I'm not really sure, but good job if you're using a SQL Server, I guess. But soon you might be using Babelfish. It doesn't mean people like it, though. It just means it's popular. <laughs> True. <laughs> it's hard to find a SQL DBA who doesn't like SQL Server. <laughs> so. That is true. The DBAs don't have to pay the license fees. They do not. <laughs> All right. Backup for Azure Managed Disk is now in limited preview. Azure Backup is a simple and secure and cost-effective cloud-based backup solution that now enables you to configure protection for Azure Managed Disks in a few simple steps. These crash-consistent backups allow you to take point-in-time backups of managed disks using incremental snapshots with support for multiple backups per day with zero infrastructure cost. The solution is agentless and will not impact production application performance. And if I had a dollar for every time a vendor told me that it would not impact production application performance, I would be retired. (laughs) (laughs) The key benefits of Azure Backup for Managed Disk is more frequent and quick backups without interrupting the virtual machine, does not affect the performance of the production application, no security concerns, it does not require running custom scripts or installing agents, and it's a cost-effective solution to backup specific disks as compared to backing up the entire virtual machine. I mean, 
all those points are definitely like pain points that I've had to address with the custom solutions in the past. It's either something running on a machine that's got to, you know, lock the disks by do a thing. And so if the promise of this pulls off, it's great. And I'm confident they made good progress in this area. But like if you start with unmanaged disk and I'm like, hey, I got a bunch of unmanaged disk. And I ask you, Ryan, like, I'm going to manage your disk for you. What's the first thing you ask for? <laughs> the first thing I ask for is auto scan. And manage, <laughs> not back up. I'd be like, back up, back it up. I'm assuming if you're going to manage it for me, you're going to back it up. It's a managed disk that doesn't back itself up. Like, well, then mm-hmm. what happens when it goes away? Well, it's not our problem. It's not part of our management. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I like the confusion. I'll tell of like, you that well, it went away. You know, now this article's come out, I had to now ask, well, which disks are covered by this backup service? I mean, you've got ultra premium blob storage, you've got ultra premium disk, you've got premium disk, you I, like you got manage premium, manage ultra premium. Like there's so many options here. Like it's just complexity on top of complexity. I mean, nothing says no security concerns like taking a copy of your production data and putting it someplace. Surely security concern number one should be where's the copy being stored? Is it encrypted? Where's it going? Is it in the same access account? to it? Like, or is it in a different account? Because if it's in the same account, then it's a risk too because a hacker could delete the backup. Yeah. But if it's in a different account, think about you know, data sovereignty and the whole thing's there. Right, like exactly. It, yeah. It's is it in chaos. the right country? Yeah. It's just, it, it's turtles all the way down so quickly. Yeah. <laughs> well, if you've been confused about high trust in the healthcare space and the shared responsibility matrix and how they interact with each other, Azure has your back. Azure and HITRUST are now publishing a shared responsibility matrix. And this partnership with the Healthcare Information Trust Alliance, which is what HITRUST means, is a new shared responsibility matrix that provides clarity on roles and responsibilities for implementing solutions in Azure that meet the rigorous HITRUST standard for protecting sensitive health data. And if it meet, works for Azure, you could probably read and interpret this relatively well for Google and AWS. So I'm sure they're very similar concepts as Azure has very similar concepts to everyone else. Uh, there's a quote here from Becky Swain, Director of Standards Development at HITRUST. High trust helps organizations ensure that the highest standards of information protection requirements are met when sensitive data is accessed or stored. And the adoption of Microsoft or the shared responsibility matrix for Azure helps ensure that necessary controls are implemented and shared responsibilities are understood and met. Microsoft is an organization that can be counted on for keeping information safe. I want to make a joke on all this, but the reality is that these things are super helpful because typically when something is designed, you know, whoever makes the decree to make something high trust, you're getting a whole bunch of people involved in a certification process they have no idea which compliance rules are what and how the actual controls are and how they're evidenced so something as simple as like a matrix of like i gotta do these three things that can turn into a to-do list is really really super helpful so i'm all for it yes especially when you have all of these workloads out there now that fall under hipaa and you know you could be held criminally liable as a leader of one of these companies it's not a joke and then there's no certification for it so high trust just makes it's so important to have something out there that you can actually go get audited against. And I love seeing that they're partnering with high trust here. Well, that's it for new news this week. Peter, do you want to take us to the lightning round? Of course. So with little AWS step functions, adding support for AWS glue data brew jobs to prepare data in analytics and machine learning workflows. Apparently it wasn't the horse making those steps. That's where the glue came from. I want <laughs> to tell the AWS product team to go home. They're drunk because adding an automated decision workflow and coupling it with a no code solution for ETL makes no sense to me. Amazon EC2 auto scaling now allows you to define 40 instance types when defining mixed instance policies. Which just sounds like a nightmare to troubleshoot the performance. Well, last night, between 2 and 3, the website crawled down to nothing. And then, today, it was so fast, I couldn't believe the speed. And then it now it's back to dog slow. And that's because it's changing instance types all day long on you. That's nice. Are you trying to say the performance is spotty? <laughs> it's a bit ah! spotty. <laughs> <laughs> that would have worked if this was for spot instances. <laughs> <laughs> Who doesn't use spot instances? <laughs> a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. Well, Amazon Cloud Search announces an update to its search instances, letting you use lots of new instances for Cloud Search. This is just the uh, the reminder that this service exists. Hey, guys, we haven't had a blog post <laughs> yeah. in three years. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> let's change something just so we can do it. I mean, with Elasticsearch this week, like this might be this, this could have been their small. I'm like, hey, you're tired of that Elasticsearch licensing problem? Here, let's just do a Cloud Search. <laughs> now we can solve all <laughs> with- your problems. Yes, Cloud Search with Elasticsearch compatibility coming soon. 
Amazon EC2 API now supports IPv6. Because no one asked for this feature. I don't use IPv6. Who uses IPv6? Why do I need my API to respond to it on IPv6? I don't understand. Thank you. I'm glad it supports IP freely. (laughs) (laughs) It screws everything up or (laughs) figures itself out. He's on fire. (laughs) Customers can now tag resources in the Amazon Bracket console. I mean, I would have thought I would have known if it was going to be tagged or not automatically. Like it's tagged and untagged. Probably is what that was. Yeah, it was weird. Nothing else, huh? All right, Amazon Redshift now supports fine grained access control on copy and unload commands. Why only copy and unload? Like you couldn't come up with anything better. Like these are the only two things we want you to do. And Amazon Light Sale now also supports IPv6, which is only there because of the fact that Google will not rank your web page well on mobile devices, and they're trying to sell light sale to companies who use WordPress and all kinds of other things that need mobile. And so it was a problem. So thanks, Google. There you go. I was going to say, because, you know, if configuring at the orchestration deployment of your app was too complicated, let's introduce IPv6 to it. Can't we just go back to MAC addresses? <laughs> I mean, that's basically what they are. I mean, yeah. <laughs> it's almost there. Yeah. AWS Snow Cone now supports multicast streams and routing by providing instances with direct access to external networks. This feature makes me really sad because I hate it when my snow cone turns into streams. Oh, <laughs> uh, you got to get a waffle cone. <laughs> I don't think a snow cone or a waffle cone would mix well. That just seems like a soggy mess. Speaking of soggy messes, <laughs> yeah. Amazon SNS adds support for message archiving and analytics via Kinesis Data Firehose subscriptions. I mean, since the podcast has started, I don't have as many of these things. Like, it doesn't support this already because I, I thought I got through all of them. But this is one I didn't know. It didn't exist. <laughs> I did not know that you cannot use SNS and Kinesis Data Firehose subscriptions. Cross off your bucket list. Yeah, it's probably also confusing because I think they actually have this question on the DevOps test. It, saying it does support it is one of the questions to mess you up because you have to know this detail, but I forgot. Sounds expensive. Yeah, really. <laughs> Sounds expensive. <laughs> the graphical user interface of porting assistant for .NET is now open source. Just because you make something open source doesn't mean people actually want to contribute to it. Like, who really wants to do porting assistant for .NET? I'm going to put that on my resume. I updated porting assistant for .NET to make it more awesome with a graphical user interface. All those bugs you no longer want to fix? Well, open source community's problem now. Right? That's how, <laughs> that's how you know you're in trouble when you, you find this really cool piece of software. Like, this is exactly what I need. And then, like, updated last time three years ago. Oh, yeah. Okay. Never mind. I just wonder if you had to tip the porting assistant for moving your data around. Oh. <laughs> Amazon CloudWatch Container Insights now available on AWS Graviton 2. And this must have been a tough feature. They had to change the scale for you know, Intel versus Graviton so they could actually calculate the chart properly? Oh, some feature. I think they had to find like a, a container that supported running on the Graviton 2 <laughs> to in, get insights into. And Jonathan wins for every single thing he said. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Making an effort. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> wow. So basically the trick here is don't say anything one week and the next week just say random stuff and you'll win because you save it up. We're just happy you're here. Yes. <laughs> uh, it's kind of like, you know, in basketball when the big man runs the floor, you have to feed him the ball and reward him for doing it so he does it next time. Mm-hmm. It's kind of what I'm doing. Got it. You do have a lot of uh, basketball analogies I noticed. Oh, do I? You do. Interesting. Usually it's poker. One of those things I picked up over the 100 episodes or so. so. Nice. Well, I haven't updated the things coming up calendar because I'm still in second 2020. And I mean, there might be a next week after the 20th. So we'll see. <laughs> let's make it through the election and the inauguration stuff. And then we'll update the things coming up calendar and all those great things. But do check out our blog post out on the website for our 100 episodes. That should be out there and published. Uh, it was slightly delayed from when we published 100, but it'll be there today or tomorrow, I think. And then by the time this gets out, it'll definitely be there. So there you go. Go check it out. Well, you say we'll get through the inauguration. I'm like, that's wishful thinking. <laughs> yeah. As I said, I said if <laughs> we get through another. the inauguration, we'll have another episode. We'll have episode 102. I don't yeah. know that we're going to at this point, but if all goes well, we will have We have to go like get, on that, get a boat I, and sail off into the Pacific and be like a pirate cloud pod station. I wish got, there were odds <laughs> on this because I would bet $100 billion that we make it through the inauguration. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. We'll have another fantastic week in the cloud. See you next week. See you. Bye, everybody. Later. 
And that is The Week in Cloud. We'd like to thank our sponsor, Foghorn Consulting. Subscribe on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts and tweet us your feedback at hashtag thecloudpod. Or join our Slack channel. Go to our website, thecloudpod.net, for sign-up instructions. Mm-hmm.